Welcome to the Black Belt Business Podcast. My name is Matthew Brenner, and today I'm with the CEO of Academy Kings, Lance Trippett. You may have seen his ads pop up on your Facebook or seen his martial arts school, his jiu-jitsu school, Conquest. And today we're going to talk a lot about his martial arts school, business, personal life. So Lance, thanks for coming on today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So I know you do a lot of consulting like I do, but obviously before that, you had your own martial arts school, your own jiu-jitsu school that you still have, right? Yep. So how many years now has it been since you first started? Uh, with the school, we opened in uh, 2009. Uh, so we, we opened a small location in 2009 and then uh, you know continue to grow beyond that. Cool. So at what point were you like, hey, I'm going to move over to the consulting side? Uh, it was a long time. Like it took us a long time to kind of figure everything out and uh, start to understand the actual stuff that that we teach now. But um, uh, you know, we didn't really start that until 2019, so 10 years later. Mm. So, what's the most frustrating thing as a school owner that you figured out that you're like, okay, I need to teach other people this? Uh, I think probably the you know one of the things I think that most school owners struggle with is leads. Um, you know, you, you talk to a hundred, hundred school owners and, and all of them say the same thing. I need more leads, need more leads. Um, so I think understanding the lead process is important, but also, uh, there's a level of, uh, understanding what they need versus what they want. And a lot of school owners want more leads, but really what they need to do is focus more on retention. Uh, so it's, I think, uh, kind of a double-edged sword. Like you definitely want people coming in the front door, but, if you're constantly having people leaving the back door, um, you know, you, you need to work on that as well. Right. You're, you're a boat with a hole in it, right? Yeah. You're just leaking. So what did you figure out about lead generation for your school in terms of maybe marketing campaigns? So you're like, okay, other schools need to be doing the same thing. Yeah, I think like everyone, when you kind of, you throw a rock, you look out the front door, you throw a rock any direction. If you're, you know, martial arts school, if you're gymnastics, if you're uh, dance school, like anywhere you throw a rock, like someone's doing some kind of free trial, some kind of, uh, you know, come in, try a free class, come in and do a private lesson. Um, so trying to stand out, trying to have a different offer, uh, I think is important on the, on the offer side of things to get leads. Uh, if you can come up with a great offer, people are going to raise their hand and say, Hey, I'm interested in that. Um, I think also when you when you start looking at leads and starting to look at the the market that we're in, you know, like say for jujitsu, yeah, there's there's some women that want to do jujitsu, there's some kids that want to do jujitsu, but but the market is somewhat limited. Uh, and when you can get outside of just people that are looking for local, you know, jujitsu in your area, and you can start to target larger demographics of people that may not know what it is, may not have ever tried it, may never even heard of it, but they, you catch their eye with a cool video or a, a cool picture. And then all of a sudden you've opened up your market a little bit. And I think, you know, uh, it's real easy to sell to people that have already been sold on jujitsu, like heard Rogan, heard whatever, and they come into the school and they want to try and they're going to sign up no matter what. But if you can open up your, your demographic a little bit, now it might be a slightly harder sales process, but you're, you're opening up to a lot more people that you can sell to. Yeah, so if we kind of in karate have the opposite issue, right? It's like mainly kids, a lot of women, but not as many for jiu-jitsu, what, probably 25 to 45-year-old males is probably yeah. the, the main demographic. Mm -hmm. So how do you think or what do you think jiu-jitsu schools need to do in order to get more women or kids involved? Because, I mean, I, I train in jiu-jitsu too. I'm not a black yeah. belt, but, you know, I pay tuition in other school that I go to. And, you know, and any, but any school I've been to that's jujitsu is generally going to be just like male heavy, you know, maybe one female in class. That's it. Yeah. I think you can, you can start to, and, and like we have women's only programs where you can start to get them in the door, make them feel a little comfortable. But you know, a lot of women just don't want to roll around with a bunch of sweaty guys. Um, and I don't really blame them. Um, so, you know, I think getting them in and, and getting uh, understanding how powerful, you know, specifically jujitsu is for a smaller person, for a weaker person. Um, if you understand the, the leverage and the techniques, you can you can utilize that in a self-defense situation. It's obviously great to get in shape and, and for fitness levels and things like that. 
Um, so I think there's a there's a give and take, and and I think you also just have to know that you know eighty percent of your people are going to be guys twenty five to to forty five or whatever, and you just have to lean in on that and and market to those people, but still have the ability to to get the people that are interested in. Hmm. So what kind of offers do you run? Like you said before, hey, like if you have a really strong enough offer, you'll get more people in the door. So what kind of offers do you guys typically run that you see work really well? So we'll do like uh, either 42 day, six week, 28 day, 21 day programs. Uh, typically we're called like a warrior challenge. We might call it like an intro to jujitsu challenge or Muay Thai, uh, something like that. If it's kids, we're leaning more towards like the kind of the buzzwords like leadership and discipline, bully proof, things like that. So the idea is having a uh, a long enough program that gives them a good experience and they can start to understand what it is that they're doing. Uh, but yet a short enough program that, that you're not having to have somebody uh, jump into a one year membership or something like that. So it's kind of like a nice middle ground where you can get them to invest in the program. But again, it, it's, it's not like, Hey, you're signing up for the rest of the year. Like, Hey, let's get you signed up. Let's make sure it's a good fit. Um, you're not going to really be able to know that in one or two classes, Let's have a, have a nice little program here. And then uh, if it's a good fit, we'll, we'll talk about what those what those stages are after that. So what's like the cost range you guys use typically for offers, especially if it's more extended, like six weeks or something? So if we're doing six weeks, it's typically $600. Um, if it's a 28-day, 21-day, then you're in the 299 kind of range um, for, for those kind of offers that we're doing. And will you advertise that price like on a Facebook ad or is that when they come in? No. Yeah. We'll typically do either. Uh, we'll talk about either a free program or we'll talk about earn a free or some kind of some kind of way to uh, get people to raise their hand, get them in, have a conversation, dig a little deeper, see what the problems are that they're trying to solve. And then, uh, you know, use that as, as part of the sales process to get them signed up. Now, I know you worked with Alex Hermosi in the past. So is that similar to his like fitness challenge, like his six week? Is that kind of you martial art? Yep. Yeah, very, thing? very similar to that. Um, you know, what we found was that the fitness challenge didn't work specifically for martial arts because there's a lot of other kind of things that are happening in the martial arts side of it. Uh -huh. um, some people are already in shape. They're not trying to lose weight. And, you know, the, all the all the different things that are kind of part of that original challenge that he had. But the, but the premise was good. The idea was good. The upfront cash was good. So we just had to take that model, completely tweak it, make it, make it work for kids, make it work for women, make it work for guys in the martial art kind of industry. Yeah, I tried to do the the fitness version of his where it's like, you know, lose weight. And if you if you reach this goal, then it's free. If you don't, and then you can carry it over the cost yeah. of it if you want to keep going. And I, I couldn't make it work because uh, also, you know, a lot of people start martial arts for a little bit different reasons than they start fitness. Like yeah. fitness, they want to lose weight. They want to get in shape. Martial sure. arts, that might be part of it, but there's also some other part, right? So yeah. I, I felt I couldn't. And I'm sure there are people that do it and do fine with it. I couldn't make it work. I tried. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's what we just, we really just tweak the offer. We made, you know, we're, he might have a diet guide that he's giving out for the fitness side. We're giving a self-defense guide. Hmm. If it's a kid, maybe we're doing like a leadership booklet or something like that to where, you know, we're, we're building in the same kind of principles yet uh, being able to sell it differently because it's not originally or, or need to be tied to weight loss specifically. So do you use like a, a program director or a salesperson for this stuff or is it just the instructor that does it? Uh, no. So we do consultations. We don't do classes where they come in. So we'll have a consultation. We'll sit down with them have about 15 minute conversation, uh, walk through what, why they are interested in martial arts, why they, you know, clicked on the link, whatever it might be, um, have that consultation with them and then, uh, get them, get them signed up. And then we put them into a, uh, specific program for whatever it is, whether it's self-defense, whether it's intro to jujitsu, Muay Thai, um, kids leadership, uh, what, whatever that program is that they're doing. And then we always actually, um, we have a start date. So we don't start people randomly. Uh, we have a start date for that new six week program, a new 28 day program. We start everybody in a big group. Um, it allows uh, a layer of accountability and a layer of retention because these people start to meet each other. They start to talk, they start to hang out. They're texting each other. Hey, you coming to class? And now, you know, just like if you were going to, uh, university or, or college, 
you meet the people in your class, you start to have a conversation, you go out to coffee, and then now this thing starts to build a retention part of the of the of the system. Very cool. So they you kind of do it in just like universities do it in like waves. So how often do you do um, uh, like an intake of, of new members? Uh, depending on what offer we're we're promoting at the time, typically we're doing three month or three week intervals. So every three weeks we're starting a new interval. Hmm. So do you see any challenges with that with people? Let's say they're, you know, they're at day nineteen before they they actually have to start. So do you feel pe people fall through the cracks or not as much? Like what uh, the at the beginning, yeah. So like like I said, it took us like a long time to figure all of it out and kind of piece it together. So we've had so many different uh, iterations of this thing over the years. So at first we were doing it, we would just start. Every, as soon as you came in, we'd start you. But then what we found out is there, there was no like friendships. There's no camaraderie. They're just kind of getting dumped into the classes. We don't know where they are in the process. And so then we, then we switched it and we were doing every two weeks. And then what we found the best cadence to be was every three weeks. Um, and then what we do is we just set up like a kind of what we call a keep them hot campaign. Um, and so between the time that they sign up and the time that they actually start, sending them some messages, some emails, talking about the program, making sure that they know, you know, typically when somebody signs up that next hour, two hours is kind of the time like, Oh man, did I, should I have done that? Like maybe I shouldn't have done that. So we want to, we want to re kind of engage them and make them like, Hey, you did a great thing. Like you're going to have a ton of fun. We're going to start to get to this result and really start to like dig into the, the kind of like accomplishment, like, Hey, you made a great choice. I uh, can't wait to get you started. And so as we added that, then we had less people kind of quitting on those between that time frame. Yeah. They just, you're top of mind, right? You're just yeah. keeping them engaged. So, yeah, so we'll, we just do, you know, like different campaigns like that through automations and, and things like that. Cool. So let's say someone does six weeks, it's 599 or 600 bucks. At, at what point do you actually enroll them to a full program? Um, we'll do a halfway meeting. So at three weeks, we talk to them. Um, we'll make them an offer. If they sign up at that point, you know, typically we'll get about uh, 50 to, to 70 percent. So I would say probably an average about 60 percent will sign up halfway through. Uh, and then we'll kind of pick up the remainder at the end of the six weeks. Um, if that, uh, you know, you might have 10, 20 percent of the people not continue, but you're still on that, you know, kind of if you can close 80 percent of them, that's that's pretty good numbers. Wait, you're telling me you don't enroll 100 percent of the people that walk in? Oh, my nope. gosh. Come on, if, Lance. If the if people tell me that, I always <laughs> say you're either too cheap or you're full of shit. You're One full of, of shit. I, I, exactly. I don't know if I can trust, but. <laughs> no, you can, you can cuss all you want. Okay. Yeah. Whenever like uh, people are like, I enroll everyone. And then it's yeah. like, OK, how many people do you have come in? Three. Well. Yeah. Okay. Well, three people are probably going to roll regardless. Some people just want to walk <laughs> in and sign up. You know, sometimes I think we get in our own way. Like people want to come yep. in and just sign up for something. Like, you know, when I went to sign up for jujitsu or the gym, I don't need the whole sales process. Like, like they'll start to do it. I'm like, stop, stop, stop. How much is it? <laughs> okay, cool. Here's my card. Like, yeah, take my money. Yeah, I, I don't need that. But obviously, some people need a little more hand holding, especially if they've never, never done martial arts before. Um, and so I listened to one of your podcast episodes. Uh, by the way, if you don't follow Lance, uh, Lance Trippett, uh, is his full name, but he also has a podcast called the BJJ Business and Martial Arts Marketing. I know it's on Spotify. It's probably on Apple Podcasts too, I'm assuming. Uh, I use Spotify. Okay. And you talked about the seven golden rules for organic. And one of the things I like, loved about your episode is I would say the first like three or four minutes, we're talking about like how it's like hard work. And like most people don't want to do the hard work. <laughs> Right. No. They just want to sit back and new members come in and sign up. Right. Yeah. And I think it's really the idea of like, and, and this is just in general. And one of our kind of core things that we talk at the Academy Kings a lot is called like chop the wood. And like my dad always said, like my dad was like an electrician. Um, and, you know, his thing was like, you know, chop the wood because you're, you're going to get heat two times when you're. You know, you're going to get warm when you're chopping the wood and you're going to be warm when you're burning the wood. Mm. Right. And it's the same idea with work. Like you just got to do the work. Uh, we we all want automation. We all want like uh, like all of these things that will make our life easier. But most of the time we're just trying to figure out ways not to work. And if you just get in your mind like, hey, I'm just going to work every day and I'm going to put the time in, I'm going to put the energy in. 
man, you're going to be successful and no, whether it's martial arts, whether it's business, whether it's your family, like whatever that thing is that you're putting work into, you're going to, you're going to have more success than if you try to figure out ways not to have to do the work. Yeah. I think people with, especially with AI, they're just hoping that they don't have to do anything besides whatever their core job is. But like, <laughs> yeah. like, like you said in your podcast, like at some point you had to become a, a marketing and salesperson, right? You couldn't yeah. just expect, I mean, you can get some level of success of, you know, just having a jujitsu school and maybe a good area, but you're only going to get to a certain amount. There's going to be a cap to that. Yeah. And I think when it, when it really comes down to it, like you said, like you just have to go all in on that, right? Like I talked to all of them, you know, I have a lot of meetings with a lot of different school owners. I'm like, you know, when, when you ask them what business they're in, it's always like, I'm in jujitsu, I'm in martial arts, I'm in taekwondo, I'm in karate, but it's like, none of them understand the, the thing that really we're in the marketing and sales. And, and no matter what it is, whether again, whether you're trying to date a new girl or, uh, you know, you're trying to marry a wife, like you're always in the marketing and sales kind of business because I have to be kind of marketing myself and then I have to be selling myself for whatever it is that I'm trying to do, right? So I have to be marketing to to my wife. I have to be selling her on the reason that, hey, you want to get married to me? Yeah, okay, cool. Like, and it's the same with my business. If I'm just worried about like, I talked to a lot of guys, they're world champions or this or that. And it's like, oh, how, how's your business going? Well, it's not going well, but you know, I got this other competition that's going to get me some new students. I mean, no, like none of that, none of that's going to actually help your business. Yeah. Um, because you, you really need to think about it as I'm in the marketing and sales business. Yeah. I a hundred percent agree. And like, you're always selling, right. No matter what it is, why the sales skill is so important. You know, one of my clients never did sales ever. And he opened up a martial arts school because he, you know, loved it just like anyone else. Right. Yeah. And has a full-time professional career. So when I do consulting with him, we talk a lot about sales skills and strategies and theory. That way he could use it over yep. and over. And I sent him some sales books that I really love. I'm like, hey, read this. Because if you read this and understand this, it'll make everything way better, way easier. And I, I grew up on like Zig Ziglar and oh, yeah. Tony Robbins, obviously. Um, and of course, listening to a lot of Maya and Natma stuff. So, you know, that was always helpful. Now I don't think as helpful. Um, uh, in, in, in where I am my career now, but definitely like help me go the right direction at, the, at certain times. Yeah. I think whether it's industry specific or outside of the industry, like the more that you can learn, the more that you dig into these different skill sets, um, the more you're able to implement them. Obviously, if it's a industry specific kind of uh, information, it's already kind of figured out like you, you pretty much just have to implement um, if it's outside of the industry. And, and that's where I try to get a lot of my information because I want to I want to have techniques that, like you said, that that are kind of uh, techniques that work based on human psychology, not just, hey, this works because of martial arts. So how do I how do I use, you know, psychology and, and different kind of ideas that will relate to martial arts. We have a great business already, so I can spend money, I can spend time, I can spend energy on kind of figuring it out, uh, you know, or going to an expert and paying them for their expertise, whether it's, hey, how to build a list, not how to build a jujitsu email list, but how to build a list in general. Um, and then kind of understanding those skill sets and then and implementing those skills. Yeah, so what are some of the masterminds or groups that you've paid for information that you've really liked? Um, so I've done Russell Brunson's uh, Two Comma Club uh, program. So we we have two two of his awards for Two Comma Club for our academy and cool. for the Academy Kings. Um, so that's that we've done over a million dollars with one specific funnel. Um, the We've done Clients and Community, which is a Facebook group kind of idea. Oh, yeah, I get uh, there. I get there. So I was in their first uh, mastermind group that they did, um, before they kind of came out with their paid program. So I went with them and kind of learned and, and I've got one of their awards for, for generating over a million dollars through a Facebook group. So we try to, again, kind of go outside of those, uh, different areas that may be specific to martial arts, but then use the knowledge that we get and relate it back to martial arts. Um, I was in Alex Hermosi's uh, winner circle before he became super famous. Uh, he had a software called Allen 
and we were one of the top sellers in his Allen software, uh, and he moved us into his winner circle for that. Cool. So is there any of those that you liked more than the others or didn't like? Like, I'll tell you my experiences too. Um, no, I mean, I, I, I think uh, I, I liked them all. I think uh, we got great ideas from all of them. Um, there was different approaches to them as well. So, you know, the, the clients and community one was really good, but it was like uh, a step back. So not a step back as in like performance, but the idea is like, you were, we were removed from them. So, uh, it made, made me look at like, okay, we're paying, you know, uh, good money for this program, but we're not actually having access to the people themselves. So, okay, maybe I don't have to have as much access to myself to be able to sell a high dollar program. So, you know, you get different ideas from these different programs. Um, I mean, obviously Alex Ramosi is a genius in marketing and sales, uh, you know, like I said, everyone kind of knows him now from, from all of his, uh, recent fame on, on Instagram and TikTok and wherever he is, he's on like everything. Yeah. Um, Russell Brunson, you know, Alex doesn't talk about it a lot, but Alex was in Russell Brunson's winter circle. So, um, so, you know, he's, he has a lot of that information and, uh, you know, so I think the information is out there and I think a lot of the information is the same, but people, you know, you change the name of it and you, you make it uh, a five frameworks instead of uh, whatever Three the other framework something. was called. Yeah. Um, and so like, I think a lot of the information is regurgitated and then it goes, you know, I was in Dan Kennedy's uh, thing for a little bit. So, uh, you know, you can, uh, and a lot of it started with Dan Kennedy, like Alex Ramosi, Russell Brunson, like all these guys, uh, got a lot of their stuff from from Dan Kennedy. So I think a lot of the information is there and just people put their own spin on it. They put their own name on it. They might tweak it a little bit. Um, they might make an industry specific, but the ideas all resonate and they all make sense if you understand the principles and then you apply the principle to whatever it is that you're trying to promote. Yeah. I, I mean, I agree with you there. There's going to be some universal concepts that make sense yeah. for anything. And you know, I've been a part of uh, maybe three three masterminds. You know, that cost you know five figures. Um, and there's some things I like. There's some things I don't like at all. Right. Yeah. But like, there's always something I get from it that I'm like, okay, well, at least I got this one thing. Right. Yeah. Like and even even learning like online marketing, uh, and and sales just online from one of the masterminds I did helped us when COVID happened and we had to now you know sign up people online. Right. Yeah. And I would never have had that same skill set of just selling online if I didn't do that one course. Sure. Right? And I think some people expect to get everything from someone when that's not really going to happen. Right. No. Like the only thing I do right now for clients is teach them organic strategies with schools, daycares, and businesses. Like, hey, here's how to get members from these three areas, do it really, really well. But like one of the things I always preface is kind of like what you said earlier is, hey, this is going to be a lot of work and I'm going to need yeah. five, about five hours a week of, of focused effort, which doesn't sound like a lot, right? No. Um, and I'll tell them like, hey, you already need that. But like, and, and but then still sometimes it'll happen where I'll get a client and, and the next week I'll be, okay, here's the four things they asked you to do. Did we do them? Oh no, I got busy. I'm like, okay, well, and I'm sure you hear that a lot, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. you go lead a horse to water, but you can't force him to drink. Yeah. Right. And that's probably the most frustrating thing of being a consultant is like, hey, you give someone the information, you know, I promise you this is going to work if you do it. I promise. I've done it over and over again. If it doesn't work, I'll find a way to make it work. Yeah. But like, you just got to do it. You got to get out and they'll find a million other reasons. Like, oh, I ordered uniforms. Or, oh, you know, I cleaned the school or I, I made a new pamphlet. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, don't do that. Yeah. I mean, those, those things aren't bad, but like you need to have time spent just on growing the business and have yeah. like a set, a set amount of time for that. Absolutely. So I was uh, yesterday, actually, um, I was talking with someone. And so people come and they have different different questions right so i was actually talking to one of my students he's he actually just moved um but they like he's in between jobs he's he actually has a job but he's like i don't like it anymore i'm trying to do my own thing so you know he's talking about uh hey i might open up a school they moved from maryland to alabama right now they're thinking about moving to south carolina open up a school so we're talking what well, talking through all that and then 
And then he was like, I don't know if you know who Cody Sanchez is. She's a uh, she's a YouTuber. She does a lot of uh, business consulting on the idea of buying businesses. She talks about buying boring businesses, car washes, laundry mats, stuff like that. Okay. Um, but one of the premises of her course is that you don't want to open a business. You don't want to start your own business. You want to buy profits. So go out and find a business that you can buy, buy the profits, and then grow it. And so he's like, hey, you know, I was like, and we were talking. He's like, oh, yeah, I just bought Cody's Cody's course. So he paid, you know, five to 8000 whatever it is for this course that he bought. And and then in the next breath, he's talking to me about opening up a school. I'm saying, so I was like, I was like, look, dude, like you literally just told me that you bought her course for X amount of dollars. And now you're telling me that you want to start a start your own school. I'm like, I want to help you start a school for sure. Like, that's not a question. But like you just bought this person's course, you're you're paying her for her expertise, and you're going against the very first thing that she said not to do. Don't start your own business. Go buy a business. Yeah. And he's like, oh, I didn't think of that. I'm like, yeah, because like, <laughs> you know, th- like listen to what you're you're paying for. Like if you have advice that you're getting and you're paying for it, especially like you probably want to listen to the advice. And like you said, if you 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 give them the information, but then they don't utilize it, man, it's like it, it doesn't work. Yeah, it's so it's so frustrating. It's like it's every time it's just like please, please, please do it. Um, but whatever, people don't sometimes, and and that sucks because I always yeah, want. Yeah, I mean, we, you want part of our ones. part of our sales process for the the Academy Kings is like we really emphasize that we are a coaching program. We're not an ad agency. Like if you want to go get ads, you know, for your your gym, and you want to pay five hundred bucks a month or whatever, like that's not what we do go find an ad agency and you can, you can get that service. Like we're a coaching program. We want to, we want to teach people how to run ads. We want to teach people the, the concepts of building an offer. We want to teach people the sales processes, all of these things that as my opinion, as a business owner, you need to know, you need to know how to get leads. You need to know how to get them to show up. You need to know how to sell them. You need to know how to keep them around, like Mm. kind of the main parts of your business. Um, So like part of our sales process, like we'll ask four or five, six different times, like, are you coachable? Like this is a coaching program. We want to make sure that you're coachable. We only take 10 people per month because we want to actually make sure that you do the stuff that we're asking you to do. And through those things, we know that we can get results. But the idea is like, if you're not coachable, if you're not going to listen to us, don't waste your money because you're not going to get success. Yeah, I, I 100% agree. Uh, I'm, I have a little less bandwidth than you, so I only accept five. <laughs> That's the max I can do. Uh, Because obviously I'm running schools too, and I just can't talk to that many people. And I do everything one on one, so if I did more than that, my brain would explode. Um, (laughs) So how do you? We're gonna have to kind of turn a little bit to your personal life. Um, So how do you balance running a business with? I think you have three daughters, right? Three daughters, yeah. Yeah. How do you balance that? I mean, at this position, it's. there was a time that it was very, very difficult, like especially before the academies were doing well. Like, I mean, uh, that was one of the big reasons that I uh, I kind of went all in on a lot of the coaching programs and masterminds and trying to figure it out because there was a time where I was a, I was a full-time electrician. I was working in D.C., which was about a 45-minute hour drive, depending on traffic. So, you know, I had to be there at 5 in the morning, getting up 4 in the morning, leave, driving to work. You know, I'm getting home two, two thirty, three o'clock, picking up the kids from daycare, taking them to the academy. I would be at the academy with the kids for three or four hours. My wife was working full time. She'd get off, come pick up the kids, take them home. I'd be at the academy till 10 at night, come home, do it all again the next day. And it did get to where I was like, man, like, this is insane. Like, I'm, uh, you know, my wife was not happy with the situation. You know, she felt basically like a, a you know, single mom at that point basically taking care of the kids in the morning, taking care of the kids in the evening. And so, you know, it got to a point where there was some rough patches uh, and, and we were like, you know, some things got to change, either got to get rid of the Academy, got to get rid of the electrical job, something. And that's where I went like kind of all in on, on a lot of these coaching programs and trying to figure out how to do the marketing better and do the sales better and all that. So long story short, at this point, you know, I was able to, to quit the electrical work. I was able to kind of go all in at the Academy um, and so now it's, it's pretty good. Like we have people in place at the academies that, that do most of the evening stuff. I teach one night a week, just more to train than anything. So I'll, I'll go in a couple nights a week and I might train for an hour or two. Um, but I do most of my training in the mornings. Um, 
you know, so now it's really when I get home, I can hang out. I help my kids with school, you know, take them to their lacrosse, basketball. They all play travel sports on, on lacrosse, basketball and soccer. So we're constantly, you know, at tournaments, at, uh, at different events. So now it's pretty good. Like uh, my weekends are completely free. My evenings are free other than if I want to go do my one class. Um, so, you know, really it's, I think, building the thing that's working, making money with the thing, and then being able to back out, right? So, you know, when you look at like an org chart, at first we're like every level of that org chart. We're teaching the classes, we're cleaning the mats, we're answering the phones, like whatever the thing is, we're doing it. And then the idea is like get really good at quitting is is what I tell all our guys. So I want you getting really good at quitting so that you can quit being the instructor. You can quit cleaning the academy. You can quit doing the front desk, quit doing the admin. And so we want to keep kind of quitting so that we keep moving up that org chart. Mm. Um, and so uh, another guy that I like, this guy, Roland Frazier, uh, he's also in the you should buy businesses. Yeah, I've seen his category. ads. Yeah. yeah, so Roland kind of talks to the point of, you know, you know, we talk, most people have heard that, uh, entrepreneurial, uh, what is it? Uh, the e-myth. Um, so the idea is like, you want to work on the business, not in the business. And they've heard the, or read the book, the e-myth. And most people kind of understand that concept of like, okay, I don't want to be teaching all the classes, doing all the stuff, but I want to be spending my time working on the business to grow the business. And there's like one more level above that. Um, and the idea is working above the business. So like truly being on the board of directors uh, as an investor versus being the CEO. And so that's my kind of goal is to keep working myself out of the CEO role and work above the business because that allows me to do more investments. That allows me to do more time with my family, whatever it is that uh, that I'm really kind of spending that energy on at that time. So have you ever purchased a business? Like Roland's or uh, Cody's yes. Okay. What kind of business did you buy? Yeah. So we bought, uh, we bought one, uh, jujitsu school. Okay. Uh, I've bought, uh, some other like little stuff, but nothing. Um, it was more just like kind of investing into a business than buying a business. Okay. Uh, so two of the academies that we have ownership in, we, we invested into not really bought the business. Um, so we have two full academies and we have two that we've kind of have partnerships in. Um, I've tried to buy a lot of businesses, but, uh, a lot of people tell me that I'm, I, I like to lowball people. So, okay. uh, I, I wasn't able to get the businesses that I tried to get, but I think also it comes with a level of, uh, most people don't understand what a business is actually valued at, um, because it's their baby. So they, they feel their baby is worth a lot of money when in reality, their baby is not worth that much money. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a level of education that people need to know as business owners. Uh, if you're doing everything in your business, your business isn't worth a lot of money because no investor is going to come in to buy themselves a job. Yeah, exactly. I think people always think that they're going to sell their martial arts school. I'm like, who's going to buy it? Like you think an yeah. investor wants to come in and buy a martial arts school where you're the head teacher, you're the head person, you're not going to work there anymore. No one's going to want to do that. No, not uh, at all. <laughs> so you bought one jujitsu school. We bought one jujitsu school. Actually, we bought it in 2019. We kept it for a year. We put people in place and then we sold it to the people that we put in place. Oh, um, amazing. It wasn't super lucrative, but they're still part of our team. It was more of like they, they were going out of business. It was a good deal. Yeah. We, I think we spent like $5,000 for the whole business. Yeah. mats, students, everything. Yeah. Um, and then we ended up putting our own people in place. Uh, and then they bought the business from us actually right before COVID. Yeah, we actually had something similar, a school that was struggling during COVID. We had like a big team, right? So it was easy for us to like rely on each other during COVID when all the changes were happening. And the school yep. was kind of going down. We knew them from like, um, we knew them from just other martial arts marketing events and they're like, Hey, like yeah. the guy wanted to retire. And we, we took over with most of his staff, honestly. And now they're just like, and it's funny cause he kind of like retired and we bought it from him, but he still basically works there uh, because he loves it. <laughs> right. And now That's he's great. just part of our family and team. Right. So he, instead of yeah. being like a lone business martial artist, like now he's like part of a team and family gets to come to our meetings and he is part of our family now. So it's like super cool to see. 
yeah. um, really, really works out for everyone. Um, so in the in the beginning, you said you mentioned like high ticket or sorry, this is, I, I think I heard from your podcast. You, you talked about high ticket selling for martial arts schools, um, especially when you're doing like organic strategies for bringing people in. Like you want to have some sort of high ticket offer. So what does that generally look like for martial arts schools? Like a martial arts schools, like when I think of high ticket offer, martial arts is not usually the first thing that comes to mind, right? Usually it's like a, you know, yeah, coaching or information program. And I would say when I say high ticket, it's more kind of like, um, you know, getting that five ninety nine or more. So if we can if we can sell that higher ticket kind of uh, trial or you know pay in full or a lifetime membership those kinds of things uh, it allows us to be able to do more of that organic kind of approach um, or even paid ads you know you if if I'm you know that's the Dan Kennedy principle of you know uh, if I can if I can generate money from a lead uh, I can get as many leads as I want right. So whoever can spend the most money to acquire a lead or a student um, is going to win. So that's our kind of concept and our principle. Like we just keep spending money on ads because we know that we can get more leads, more eyeballs. Uh, and so the idea is if you know, what most people don't understand and why they, why they stop running ads is because they don't have a good converting offer that, that allows them to liquidate that cost of that lead or those uh, new students. So they spend a thousand dollars on ads. They don't make any money because they don't have a great sales process. And then they turn their ads off because they're like, "Oh, I can't spend any more money on ads." So the idea of of you know, Alex calls it client finance acquisition. We call it LPL leads pay for leads. Dan Kennedy calls it whatever he calls it. But the idea is having an offer that we can spend a thousand dollars on ads and we can collect three thousand dollars that same month. So now if I want to spend 2000 the next month, I can collect 6000. If I spend 3000, I collect 9. And so the idea is you keep kind of pushing money behind your ads uh, if you have a good acquisition process because I can literally get clients for free or get paid to get clients. Yeah, that's awesome. So then what do you teach people for the retention side? Like you said, most of the time you th people think they just need more leads. I think also a lot of martial arts schools, which is probably similar in any business industry, but they think like, oh, my place is different, right? You probably hear that a lot, right? So Yeah, and I think one of the things I think where people, uh, most people don't have successful schools, truthfully. So that's one of the problems. And, and so what we found is, uh, you know, if you have 50 or 60 students, not saying you don't have a successful school, but you're not making a lot of money or you might not be growing. And so if these people have 50 or 60 students, they've been at 50 or 60 students for two years now. I talked to a lot of people like, oh, yeah, I'm still at 50 since COVID. I was at 80 and then we went down. We're still at COVID. And so um, the idea, though, is, yes, at, at 60 students, if you're losing 10%, you're only losing 10 or six students a, a month. Um, so if you're gaining six students, you're kind of like what, what we call tree line is the idea that, you know, you kind of get to a certain point. And I lived in Colorado for a long time uh, and there's a tree line at 10,000 feet. So you can look out into the mountains and at 10,000 feet, basically trees stop growing. So you see the trees and then then you just see the mountain. And so the idea of tree line for us is that uh, people are stuck at a certain level and they can't get above that. And typically what it is is either they're not getting enough new students or they're losing too many current students or there's a mix of both. So the idea is you have to fix one of those things. You either have to spend money and get more people in the door or you have to fix your retention and keep more people around. And so, like I said, at 60 students, it might not be a big deal because you're only losing six students if you're at 10%. But once you get to 100, once you get to 200 students, if you're at that 10% churn, now you're losing 20 students a month. And if you don't have a way to get 20 plus students on new students, you are losing or going backwards. So that's where like really what we kind of find is that that kind of 125 and above is really where you want to be focusing on that retention because if you can go from, you know, 10% down to 5%, you just saved your business really. Yeah, people, it's not as like a sexy number, right? Retention no. or attrition, people 
you know, they people just want to say gross. They don't care yep. if they make any money as long as they can say, <laughs> oh, you know, we grossed 40,000. It's like, how much is your expenses? Like, uh, 39. It's like, okay, great. <laughs> you know, there'll be like a high end shopping mall or something. Um, yeah. anyway, so you moved from Colorado. How long ago was that? Oh, when was that? Uh, let's see. I think, let's see. I've been there maybe 18 years now. I've been okay, back here. Cool. My sister lives out in Colorado. I was actually just there last week. Uh, oh, really? What yeah, part? Broomfield. Okay. So I was in, I was in Aspen for eight years. Cool. Uh, my wife is from Grand Junction, uh, Colorado. We met there at X Games at Aspen. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we dated on and off for a while. Wait. You didn't compete at X Games. You were just at no. Okay. Uh, I was just I was just bartending. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Wait, you were bartending, and she went to come get a drink. What happened? Uh, actually, one of my uh, one of my buddies knew one of her roommates at the time, so they li- she was living in in Denver. Uh, they came there for the weekend for X Games. One of my friends knew one of her friends. Hey, got some girls in town. You want to go out to dinner with us? Sure. So we went out to dinner, and then we all hung out, and um, and then. We just basically started dating long distance and broke up once, got back together, and and it's history. <laughs> wow, that's that's really cool. I didn't know. Yeah. I, I Aspen, I assume, was just like a ski town. I didn't know people like really live there full time. I guess they do. Yeah. The, so the I think the I, I I don't quote me on this, but I think it's like a normal population of you know maybe three to five thousand during all times of the year, and then during ski season and actually summer, um, you know, it'll go up. 10, 15, 20,000. Uh, so, uh, there's a core kind of group of, of locals there. Um, so it was, it was a fun time. Yeah. Bartended and went out there to snow snowboard. Uh, when I originally moved out there, I was going to move out for a season snowboarding ended up staying eight years. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. yeah. When I was out there, the reason why I brought that up also is because you mentioned the tree line and yeah. one time I was out there hiking with my sister and it was my first time hiking out in Colorado and it was a beautiful day. It was probably 75 degrees. I was wearing like a tank top. And we get past the tree line. And I could see the peak of the mountain. It's probably 15, 20 more minutes of walking. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, some clouds roll in. Temperature <laughs> drops like 20 degrees. Yeah. And it starts hailing. <laughs> and then it starts pouring rain. And yeah. like, and I kind of want to finish, but then we see some lightning and we're like, oh my God, like my sister <laughs> yeah. starts to freak out, but kind of like keep her calm. It's actually her and my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law's, uh, they, they both are, are like nature hiking people, but him especially, right? And he's like, we need to get out of here like right now. Like, like, like <laughs> keep me calm, but also like freaking out a little bit. And I didn't, I was like, who cares? It's raining, a little bit of hail, like lightning's not gonna hit us. Like, it's not a big deal. But they're like, no, people, die on mountains when they're above the tree line like that's what happens and i look down and we're probably 40 minutes from the tree line like we're far and we start running down this trail there's water pouring down the trail right because like coming down the mountain from the rain and i'm getting and i'm not dressed properly so like i'm getting um like hail, like pinging the back of my ears and it's like killing me. And I'm running down the stand and I'm like, let's go, let's go, we need to go right now. And it was like, what a, it was like, I didn't know how scared I should have been until later. And they're like, no, we, like there was lightning very close by. This is how people die in Colorado or in hiking down. I'm like, damn, that's crazy. Yeah, for sure. It, uh, it will, the, the weather, you know, I don't know if that's like everywhere they say that, but Maryland, they also kind of say that where it's like, you know, the weather can change in, you know, 10 minutes or whatever, wake up or walk outside. It's going to be different. But um, Colorado is definitely like that where it can be super nice. And then all of a sudden snowstorm. Yeah. So and now, especially at that, at that higher elevation too. Yeah. So now I don't hike unless I also have a jacket, even if it's beautiful out. Yeah. Right. Like I was just there. I went hunting for um, duck. Okay. It's my oh, nice. second time going hunting. Um, and we left at like 3.30 in the morning. You know, we're out by the water at like 5, 5.30-ish, and it is freezing. And like one of the things <laughs> I didn't know was that when the sun comes out, this is what my brother-in-law told me. I don't know how true this is. But he said when the sun comes out for the first like like hour, it'll actually be colder than it was when it was dark, but then it'll warm yep. up afterwards. I yeah, don't know if it like – That's true. That's true? Well, why is that true? How is that possible? I don't know, but I hunt all the, I also hunt. Um, and I, I noticed that as well. And the only thing I can think is that it probably has something to do with, 
uh, cold air drops. So as the the air is heating up from the sun up higher, it's probably oh, pushing the colder air down. Is the only thing I can think of. Yeah, that that would make sense. What do you what do you like hunting? Uh, I usually hunt deer. Deer. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And where do you usually hunt? Uh, so my family has a farm in West Virginia, which is an hour and a half from from where I live. Um, and then my my cousin has a place uh, outside of Gettysburg, which is about an hour from where I live. So is this like a tree stand situation or are you walking yep. around? Oh, okay. Yeah, we do tree stands and um, yeah, so we have them kind of throughout our property up there. So how, how many hours will you sit still in a tree stand? Uh, I mean, you usually get up before, before light. So about an hour before it gets light. And then, uh, you know, if it, let's say that's six o'clock, probably stay out till 11, something like that. And then go in for lunch, go back out at, uh, at two, something like that. Well, yeah, I found it very difficult to sit still, like immensely difficult. I cheat though. I, I'd listen to podcasts and oh, okay. read and, um, so I have it kind of set up pretty nice. I can kind of see <laughs> things coming in and out. So I just like kind of hang out. <laughs> yeah, we got we got no ducks. I didn't even shoot my shoot the gun. I uh, just didn't show up, and I was free. And like my brother in law had these uh, like heat packet thing, like the instant warmer yeah. things, um, and they were expired. And he didn't realize, and they didn't work. <laughs> so it was really <laughs> cold. Um, but after we didn't get ducks, we we're out there for like two and a half, maybe three hours, and. I, I can't really sit still like in general. So yeah. this was like real tough for me. And <laughs> he's like, all right, well, there's, we kind of reached diminishing returns. There's nothing else is probably going to show up. So uh -huh. do you want to see if we can get like a rabbit or something? I was like, sure. He's like, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll pack up. We'll go see if we can get a rabbit. And we're flushing out. We're walking around the bushes, like him on one side, I'm on the other. And we're like, all right, well, if we walk this way, we'll flush out a rabbit. We get out of the car. We start walking. Within a, one minute, a giant snowshoe hare pops out. He shoots it. And this thing is huge. It's like as long as like my torso. It was enormous. Oh, yeah. They're big. Yeah. This thing was huge. And um, so we cooked it up and ate it. And it was like at best a five out of ten. <laughs> it was not good at all. Um, and like, you know, we did all this like fancy recipe we found online for. And one thing I didn't realize is that. Uh, uh, rabbits are white meat and hares are red meat. Oh, really? So you can't just look up, um, you know, rabbit recipe. Rabbit. It has to be hair specific. Huh. So there was, you know, it's not as much. It. Yeah, but it was, it was terrible. I would not, would not recommend that. Um, yeah, we so, were supposed to go yeah. Colorado elk hunting this year, but, uh, but we're moving our academy. So we, we kind of postponed the trip. Why are you um, moving? Uh, lease lease up and then uh the we've been trying to buy the building for five years and and the owner won't sell uh and then at the, we were at the end of our extensions and all that so we have there's 21,000 square foot building we had about 7,500 of it that's huge and uh the guy that has the rest of the building wants the whole building so he basically was just outbidding us um so we said okay cool and and there were some issues with the building and things like that so we we've just moved on to a, to a different spot did you find a new lease or did you buy something yeah yeah so uh, we're uh we'll, we'll probably be out uh i mean depending when this is happening this podcast comes out but we'll be uh moving in january to the new spot uh very cool same amount of square foot or uh, yeah, just, uh, just on, well, it's, it's actually more usage space. Uh, the usage will be better because it'll be one level right now. We have like two levels, okay. so there's a little bit of like kind of choppiness to it. So we'll have 7,200 square feet, one, one area. Are you paying the same amount of rent you were paying before a little more, a little less? Slightly more. Yeah. I okay. think we were paying 12 before now we're at like 15, 15 a square foot. Yeah. That's pretty good. That's like dreaming. It's still really cheap. Yeah. Everything we were looking at was like 20 plus. Yeah. We pay like 30. So yeah. um, 30 and above, especially if it's a downtown school. It's like near. near yeah. we school. Ours are always in like um, industrial kind of places. So we, we go heavy on the online marketing. So we don't need the retail. So we, we spend the money on the on the space. And then uh, we do we just kind of go heavy on the, on the marketing. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because – like either spend the marketing on, either spend the money on the marketing or you spend the money on the real estate. It's like those are your yeah. two options. 
Uh, and I, like, I see the upsides for both. Like, you know, some of the schools that don't do any marketing and the people just show up all the time, like, damn, so jealous. <laughs> right. But then they have super high rent. So yeah, it's, or, you know, the, the mortgage is really high or whatever. So, um, yeah, I mean, both are, both can be good, but I feel like when you can buy, which it sounds like you try to do, yeah. like that's obviously better. There was there nothing available. No, uh, we actually put a, we put an offer in on a building, um, it was going to be a little bit small, so we ended up kind of walking away from it. But we did put an offer on a building when we were in this uh, situation trying to find a new spot. But um, there's just not – I mean, you know, we're, we're trying to stay within a couple miles of, of the current location too because we have a lot of students and they kind of come – we're right on an interstate. So people are coming kind of from, you know, 10 minutes either direction. We can pick up a lot of different people. So we're kind of stuck to that location um, so we were trying to find, you know, something within a mile or two of that spot and there's just not a lot of, uh, big enough spaces for us. Yeah. No, I hear that. There's uh especially for, for us, like we have some city schools and, and suburban, right? So yeah. city schools, like as much as I want to buy, it's like almost impossible. There's like very few options available and they're super expensive. Yeah. We're just like really crappy. It's just not, don't work well for us. Um, yeah, so I, we're, we'll do a, we're going to do a shorter lease. We'll do like a five-year lease with okay. a five-year option. And then, uh, during that time, we're going to be looking to try to build or buy or something if we, if we can find something. Very fun. Um, yeah. so we're winding down here, but I wanted to ask some other questions that I'm just curious, like what you think. So the first thing is, um, what books do you feel like have shaped your career the most? Uh, I mean, it'd probably be like all the normal ones, I guess, you know, rich dad, poor dad. I, I do a lot of real estate investing. I like, uh, I like real estate. My family's all into real estate. So I think rich dad, poor dad was a, was a great book. Um, uh, I like e-myth. Um, I think that was a, that's a great kind of operator's book. So if you're going to be operating a business, um, I think a lot of those principles are, are super important. Um, I would say probably those are probably my two YouTube top is. for for business uh, business ideas. Cool. All right, next question. Would you rather spend one year at the North Pole or two years in the Sahara Desert? Uh, I mean, I would probably go North Pole, I guess. North Pole? I yeah. thought you're a hunter. Oh, you could deal with like the cold. I'd get a snowmobile, hang out. <laughs> you're, like, you're like, that actually sounds nice. How do I sign up? Uh, what's, what's one idea about you that you think the majority of people get wrong? Um, get wrong. Um, I guess, I mean, a lot of, uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Um, I guess, uh, a lot of people think I work a lot, which I guess I do, uh, to a point, but I kind of. I don't really look at it as work. Like to me, it's just like, I enjoy it. So, you know, if I'm, you know, writing emails or something like that, people are like, Oh, you work too much. You work too much. But it's like, I still have plenty of time that I spend with my family, my friends, like, uh, you know, I even get to watch television sometimes. So it's like, uh, I get to train whenever I want. So for me, it's like, I work a lot, but it's like things that I enjoy. So I don't really look at it as work. Um, I guess. Yeah, and if you enjoy what you're doing, it's yeah. not a big deal, right? If I was sitting in an office all day, every day, I'd probably blow my brains out. But the fact that I actually yeah. have to talk to people and do stuff, like, it's not a big deal. Yeah. Um, what is what's the best gift you've ever received? Uh, my kids, probably. Okay. I think, uh, you know, I like I love my kids. Like, I uh, feel like you gotta say that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think it is though. It's like I mean they they. As much as they make me upset, they like, you know, make me so happy all the time. Uh, yeah, they always make me laugh and uh, we just have great, great time together. Cool. What's a, a tool or a software you've used in your business that you think everyone needs to know about, like everyone should be using? Uh, it's going to sound dumb, but Google, Google Sheets, Google Docs. Okay. Like I just think it's like so easy. Like you can collaborate super easy. I, I feel like I'm not a big tech guy. So for me, uh, you know, everybody wants like, oh, we got to get on Slack. We got to get on Monday, this, that, like all these different things. And it just always ends up being more complicated than it's worth to me. Yeah. Um, so like 
if I have a to-do list, I just do it on a Google sheet, like, and I can check it off and I can go back and look at it and see what needs to be done. Um, so to me, it's almost a lot of times I think people are kind of like what we talked about. Like people are looking for the solution that's going to make their life way easier. And it ends up like making your life harder in a way because you're just spending so much time trying to figure it out. Um, I've got so many notifications on my phone and things like that. I like, I would rather just have it as, as easy and, and, you know, less techie as possible, really. Yeah. I think people overcomplicate things all the time. Right? They <laughs> yeah. need to have whatever new software or something as like, dude, and I, I think like a lot of it is like, you know, podcasts as, as good as they are, they're just as bad because they do, they hear someone say, Oh, like my team's on Slack or Basecamp or whatever it is. And they're like, Oh, well, I got to put the whole team on that now. Yeah. And like, then you just, you just, it's constantly like new shiny object, new shiny object where it's like, let's just get better at the shit we're doing. Yeah. No, I agreed. Uh, what's your favorite snack? Uh, I like candy. Just what kind of candy? You go just Skittles like, or Airheads? Like the or like everybody makes fun of me because I like the like the chalky like Smarties and like they're like you don't like good chocolate. I'm like no, just like Smarties and stuff like that. Smarties as your favorite candy snack. <laughs> I just lost all respect for you, Lance. Yeah, that. right. <laughs> I think the worst. Pretty much snack any is... snack I like, but so, uh, so like, like candy sweet joke. candy, not chocolate. Not too much chocolate. Okay. I'll eat it if it's there, but if if it's like a bag of Smarties and a bag of uh, Godiva, I'm going with the, you know, the Smarties. Smarties. Uh, complete this answer. I feel most alive when. I think like hunting and fishing and stuff, just out like. In, in the environment, like in nature, uh, I, I just feel like I, I can kind of let go and not have, uh, you know, I kind of get into the into the mix and, and just enjoy walking around and, and doing that kind of stuff. Cool. Uh, well, thank you so much for being on here. If someone wants to reach out to you and find you, how do they, how do they reach you? Uh, so Instagram, I think it's just Lance Trippett. Um, I have a YouTube channel, Listen to Lance. And then uh, if you're on Facebook and you you do have a martial arts school, we have a free Facebook group. It's BJJ Business and Martial Arts Marketing. Free Facebook group for school owners. We kind of uh, restrict who can get in that. So it is just school owners in there um, or people managing schools. Uh, but we give a lot of free content in there and a lot of free information in there. Cool. Well, thank you so much for being on here. Um, I'm excited to see pics and, and hear about the new school as, as you move and open. This will be out way before then. So um, <laughs> we'll, uh, I want to see those updates as they come later. So thanks so much, Lance. Perfect. Thank you so much.